Here's everything you might have missed in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 5. Do you want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, if so, you are in luck, because that's exactly what The Falcon and the Winter Soldier's fifth episode delivered on right down to its very title, Truth. After the brutal finale of last week's The Whole World is Watching, we weren't sure quite what to expect. But The Falcon and Bucky Show's episode 5 delivered its fair share of surprises and set the stage for what's sure to be an epic finale next week. We're going to break down all the Easter eggs, references, and hidden details that you might have missed. And as always, if you prefer to read all about it, Rosie Knight has you covered over on Nerdist.com, and I will link to that in the description below. However, in order to talk about this episode, we do need to spoil it. So if you haven't seen it yet, or you click this video by mistake, go outside and just play catch with a friend until this is all over. All right, let's get into it, shall we? So Truth, ironically enough, begins with John Walker unable to accept the truth of what he just did. He's running from the fact that he just murdered one of the Flag Smashers, Nico, with Captain America's shield in front of a crowd of people. He went from the world star to world star in the blink of an eye. Loki freaking out, dazed, bloodied, confused, John crouches alone in a warehouse, and the way he's positioned over his shield evokes the cover of Captain America number four, which is fittingly enough, the conclusion of a storyline called Out of Time, which is what John is. When Sam and Bucky confront him, Walker echoes his and Lamar's catchphrase to each other. Time to go to work. But the only thing that seems to be working here is John's guilty conscience trying to work overtime to justify murdering someone else who did not, in fact, murder Lamar as he claims. That blood is on Carly's hands, but for John, that doesn't matter. He's increasingly unhinged, perhaps as a result of grief, shock, adrenaline, and the super soldier serum that's now coursing through his veins. While not exactly the same visual tableau as the Civil War fight between Tony, Steve, and Bucky in Siberia, this brutal battle is full of shocking moments. In Bucky's case, literally, in Sam's case when Walker rips off his wings in an unsubtle yet symbolic moment, and in Walker's case when they do the exact opposite of lending him a helping hand. <laughs> During this battle, we get nice callbacks to certain late motifs from the Winter Soldier and the Civil War soundtrack, and there's a particularly chilling moment where Walker says, I am Captain America, right before he almost turns back into Decap in America and nearly kills Sam. This assertion, which we'll see again during Walker's trial, echoes his imposter syndrome from the comics. Back in Captain America number 348, Walker battles the original Flag Smasher, who repeatedly insists that Walker isn't the real Captain America, much to his chagrin. Walker is obsessed with being Cap because he thinks it makes him special. And it's sad because when the Red Skull asks Steve Rogers what makes him so special back in the first Avenger, Steve doesn't mention his vibranium shield or his super soldier serum. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Well, to be fair, he does have America's ass, and that is pretty special. But I do digress. Now, another poignant moment during this battle is Sam being unable to wipe away the blood that's staining Captain America's shield. It's a physical manifestation of the central theme of this series and a reminder that nothing will ever be the same. Case in point, in the next scene, Sam basically leaves his identity as the Falcon behind while teasing yet another Marvel Comics hero to come, namely Joaquin Torres as the Falcon. Wait, yo, you forgot the wings. Okay, boy. In the comics, Joaquin is subjected to grisly experiments by Dr. Carl Mollis, a scientist that works alongside the power broker and fuses him with Sam's literal Falcon, Red Wing. This leads to Joaquin becoming the next person to don the mantle of Falcon. In this episode, Sam gives his old broken wings to Joaquin, who I have a feeling will find a way to make them fly again so he can step into the role of the man that he idolizes. And no, not the one on the moon, the one right here on Earth. Because unlike the unfulfilled dream of Reed Richards in WandaVision, this is actually some fantastic foreshadowing. I said! While Bucky bails to put an end to Zemo's primo schemos once and for all, Walker is stripped of his military rank, his position as Captain America, his pension, and any benefits he might have received in exchange for a lifetime of military service in front of what feels like this version of the commission from the comics. And in the comics, they were originally responsible for Steve Rogers stepping down as Captain America way back in Captain America number 332. While Walker obviously did something unforgivable, his sense of abandonment and betrayal for following the rules of a system that molded him into what he is today is tough to see how this man was chewed up, spit out, and cast aside by a military-industrial complex that will never love him back. And once again, Wyatt Russell continues to impress and add unique shades to this character. Of course, Walker may still have a bright future ahead of him thanks to a mysterious benefactor. That's right, folks. Episode 5 did, in fact, have a major celebrity cameo, but sadly it wasn't She-Hulk or Daredevil or Three Mephisto standing on each other's shoulders in a trench coat. 
Rather, it was Julia Louis-Dreyfus as Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, or Val, if you're nasty. But don't call me Val, just keep it in your head. Now, much like Star-Lord, you might be asking yourself, Who? Wait, what's that? You don't remember Val from the David Hasselhoff starring 1998 made-for-TV movie Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., where she was played by Lisa Rinna? That's okay, we've got you covered. Created by Jim Steranko, Val first appeared in 1967 Strange Tales 159, and she was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury's love interest, but she ultimately turned out to be working for Hydra as one of their leaders, Madame Hydra. And honestly, it gets even more confusing from there because she was also later revealed to be a sleeper agent for Russia the entire time. Suffice to say, she is a shady character with ulterior motives galore. As for what to expect from the MCU version of Val, well, consider the following. Another version of Madame Hydra basically ruled over Madripoor with an iron fist, and Val knows all about the super soldier serum and that John no longer has the shield. In the comics, Val also operated an all-female group of super spies known as the Fem Force, which included, you guessed it, Sharon Carter. So this has us thinking that maybe, just maybe, Val could be the power broker, and Sharon Carter could be working with her or for her within her system. Then again, in the comics, Val was also a Skrull agent for many years, sent to spy on Nick Fury and learn about all of his secrets, so maybe she could also be a connection to the upcoming Secret Invasion Disney Plus series as well. Originally, this character was supposed to appear in Black Widow first, but the pandemic had other ideas. Regardless, this character seems to be very important moving forward, even if her business card is a little bit light on details. There's, there's nothing on it. Moving on from here, we catch up with Carly and the other Flag Smashers who are grappling with the fact that the Global Repatriation Council is retaliating against them by raiding refugee camps that are accused of helping them. She initiates the next phase of their plan, a coordinated strike on the GRC's New York City headquarters during an upcoming vote on the Patch Act, legislation mentioned last episode that would restore traditional pre-blip border regulations, which is something in direct opposition to the One World, One People ethos of the Flag Smashers. Now, Carly isn't the only one with a score to settle, because Bucky also tracks down internationally renowned dancer Baron Zemo to Sokovia, where this crafty criminal is paying his respects at a memorial for those killed during the Battle of Sokovia. It's the battle between the Avengers and Robot California that destroyed the city in Avengers Age of Ultron. And while Zemo urges Bucky to put Carly down for good, the Winter Soldier pulls a gun on him. And for a moment, you think Bucky's about to make amends with Zemo by shooting him in the face. And Zemo, to his credit, accepts this pretty gracefully. But it's a fake out. And Bucky hands Zemo over to the Dora Milashe, who for some inexplicable reason decide to take him to the Raft, the underwater prison first seen in Captain America Civil War, designed to contain enhanced individuals and the worst of the worst. They want him to answer for the crime of murdering King T'Chaka during the bombing attack on the UN back in Civil War as well. And with Zemo heading to the raft alongside other presumed supervillains, one can't help but wonder if this is teasing a Thunderbolt set up somewhere down the line, but only time will tell. Although Io tells Bucky he should stay out of Wakanda for the time being, she can't refuse the White Wolf one last favor, especially now that he helped deliver Zemo back to their hands. But more on that in just a little bit, because next up, Sam returns to Baltimore to get some answers of his own from Isaiah Bradley. And this is the most direct interpretation of the episode's title, Truth. Isaiah Bradley was first introduced in 2003's Truth, Red, White, and Black miniseries. After running into the future Young Avenger, Eli Bradley out front, Sam has a heart-wrenching conversation with Isaiah about his experiences with the Super Soldier program, his imprisonment, and how the government essentially turned him into a living ghost, a man without a past. Isaiah's story parallels his comic book origins. He was part of a large group of black soldiers that were experimented on by the US government in an effort to recreate super soldiers in the vein of Steve Rogers. And this is a chilling parallel to the real life Tuskegee experiments, especially with the direct invocation of the Red Tails in this episode. They saw Isaiah and other soldiers injected with experimental serums without telling them what they were really for. And when test subjects were captured behind enemy lines, the U.S. wanted to bomb the POW camp to smithereens rather than actually rescue them, a matter that Isaiah thankfully took into his own hands. So does that mission sound familiar? Because it should. It's essentially exactly what Steve Rogers did back in Captain America the First Avenger, risking his life behind enemy lines to rescue soldiers captured by the enemy. Except Steve Rogers was rewarded with the love and adoration of millions of people all around the world eventually, and at the end of the day, Steve got to ride off into the sunset with the love of his life. Isaiah, on the other hand, was imprisoned, experimented on, and they told his wife he was dead. He was robbed at any chance at normalcy. So Isaiah is understandably disillusioned with the whole American dream and the idea of Captain America. If you ain't bitter, you're blind, he tells Sam, explaining how the world really hasn't changed that much at all. 
And all one needs to do is look at the real world headlines even this week to see the terrible truth behind Isaiah's words. While Steve Rogers and Isaiah Bradley are fictional characters, the notion of how privilege and racial inequality created vastly different experiences for them is sadly all too real. And we see it reflected elsewhere in this story as well. John Walker believes that power and privilege are his God-given rights, while Sam struggles with the notion that he's even worthy in the first place. Meanwhile, Isaiah thinks it's all bullshit. Isaiah tells Sam that no self-respecting black man would want to be Captain America, but as we see later in this episode, Sam doesn't believe that is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and he believes this cycle can be broken. All told, it's an incredibly powerful scene, and Carl Lumley and Anthony Mackie truly just floored me here. What fantastic work. After Baltimore, Sam heads back to Louisiana for some much-needed family time, where he reminds himself of what truly matters in life, and that is community. Sam's parents went out of their way to help everyone and their mother in the neighborhood. Sam's sister Sarah does the same thing for neighborhood kids, and Sam is cut from the same cloth. Helping people is in his DNA. So it's particularly heartwarming and heartening to see the community show up in force to help repair the Wilson family boat. One of the best moments in this story is when Sam and Sarah decide not to paint over the name of the boat and erase their family history. Rather, they must embrace it and chart a new course forward together. It also echoes the end credits where we see repeated images of things that have been painted over, hidden, and ignored for far too long. But perhaps best of all is when Bucky shows up to flirt with Sam's sister and gives Sam a sweet Wakandan suitcase containing what is almost definitely a new Captain America costume for him and not Pepper Potts' head. You know, for everyone out there wondering, what's in the box? Is this a joke? And honestly, while international espionage is great and all, I would also happily watch a drama set in a coastal New Orleans town about these two beefy bros opening a chain of shrimp restaurants called Bucky Gumps. I mean, look, you know it's a name that Sam would insist on just because he knows how much Bucky would absolutely hate it. Anyway, while this is happening, Walker keeps digging himself in even deeper when he visits Lamar's family to pay his respects. And it's honestly just crushing with his thousand yard stare as he lies to their faces about who killed Lamar and how he avenged their son. So perhaps he's doing them a kindness by giving them closure, but ultimately is just deepening his own grief and madness, something really hammered home as he walks past a poster advertising him as the new Captain America. Meanwhile, in Madripoor, as we pan across Theodore Jericho's The Raft of Medusa and Monet's Woman with a Parasol, Sharon Carter is brokering some power for who we soon realize are the Flag Smashers. She acts as a fixer of sorts, connecting Batroc the Leaper, whose kidnapping plot Sam foiled back in Episode 1, with the Flag Smashers to give them some sorely needed additional muscle so they can pull off their assault on the GRC. But considering how Sharon's been helping Sam and Bucky previously, and her pardon is theoretically on the line, it just feels odd that she would make the Flag Smashers even stronger by adding a trained assassin like Batroc into the mix. But who knows, maybe she's just hedging her bets, maybe she has a master plan here. I mean, remember who hired Batroc way back in Captain America the Winter Soldier? That's right, it was Nick Fury. Anyway, back in New Orleans, Bucky has his first good night of sleep in honestly God knows how long. And he gives a genuine smile when he wakes up to see Sam's nephews playing with Cap Shield. And Sam and Bucky then play a friendly game of catch in the backyard while having some real talk. Bucky apologizes to Sam for how he treated him in regards to giving up the shield in the first place, and Sam proves once again that he is an excellent counselor. Sam helps Bucky come to terms with the fact that Steve is gone, either dead or on the moon, and that Bucky needs to actually make amends to the people that he's hurt rather than violate rule number two by avenging the evils he enabled as the Winter Soldier. And I would fully expect to see Bucky confessing that he murdered Yori's son sometime in the finale, because that is the closure that both Bucky and Yori so desperately need. And while I agree that basically every character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is in dire need of therapy, Sam and Bucky might need to pay another visit to Dr. Rayner with how they struggle to put a label on their friendship. We're partners. Co-workers. But we're also a couple guys with a mutual friend. Friends now gone. So we're a couple of guys. I can live with that. Perfect. Real powerful guys being dudes energy here. Anyway, normalize telling your friends you love them. It's a good thing. Also, normalize even more training montages with Sam Wilson running shield drills, because we also get a nice callback here to Steve Rogers' iconic I can do this all day line when Sam flexes for his nephews. All day, baby. Uncle Sam! Meanwhile, in New York, the Flag Smashers assemble their flash mob of doom to lay siege to the GRC's headquarters, and Batroc shows up to the party with a suitcase full of grenades and other tactical weapons, but he makes it very clear that he has a one-track mind. I'm only here to kill the fuck. And speaking of one-track minds, at the GRC meeting, Senator Bad Guy, who apparently just travels from meeting to meeting being a real satchel of wieners, is holding court when a pair of guards working for the Flag Smashers sabotage the event. 
as the episode ends, Sam Wilson is finally about to open Wakanda's version of the Pulp Fiction briefcase to reveal his awesome new costume, and we're gearing up for an epic morally gray battle between Sam, Bucky, the Flag Smashers, and of course, John Walker in the finale next week. That's right, folks, I said John Walker because there is a mid credit scene in which we see Walker turn into Kraft in America as he builds his own shield. Now, this may not be a cave, but Walker definitely built this shield with a box of scraps, as well as his medals of honor as well. Now, this military-grade cosplay is further confirmation that the Big Apple is about to become the Big Capple in next week's finale. And there you have it, folks. That is everything we spotted in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 5. With just one episode to go, we have so many questions in need of answers and theories about what lies ahead, which we'll explore right here next week on Nerdist. In the meantime, folks, we'll keep you up to date on all things Falcon, Bucky, and MCU over on Nerdist. But first, tell us, what did you think of this episode? Did you spot anything that we missed? I was afraid you would say that. Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com.